Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeremy Shu. I'm the president of uh, ANZUS, and I'd like, you, like to welcome everyone to um, tonight's Trauma Grand Rounds. Um, this is a special Trauma Grand Rounds because it's in collaboration with the International Association for Trauma Surgery and Intensive Care, uh, also known as IATSIC. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge their uh, collaboration as well as the support of the Royal Australasian College of uh, Surgeons. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on whose land we are individually situated and recognize the continuing connection to land, waters and community. Uh, I also want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And for our colleagues um, uh, across the sea, um, now my Harry Mai. Um, so as it tonight's um, grand rounds is uh, on damage control resuscitation, and we're very lucky to do this in collaboration with the ATSIC. Um, our uh, keynote speaker is Dr. James McKay from Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, he's a general surgeon as well as an intensivist, so dual fellowship trained, uh, which is pretty unique. Um, there was only one other New Zealander who's, uh, I just learned, uh, Mike Hunter, who, who recently retired. So really, James is the only one practicing, as far as I know, in Australia and New Zealand as both an intensivist and a, and a surgeon. Um, to many people, they know that uh, this is quite common overseas uh, in the US, but it's quite unique for us down here. Um, he completed his medical degree um, in both and surgery and training and intensive care training in New Zealand. Um, also completed a, the master's degree in trauma sciences um, through the Queen Mary University in London. Um, he actually did a clinical trauma fellowship um, in Vancouver um, uh, before moving back um, to Christchurch where he practices as both a general trauma surgeon and an ICU specialist. So we're really looking forward to that talk. Um, we're also very lucky to have um, a representation from uh, local uh, members um, on the panel. We have uh, Dr. Alex Douglas, uh, an anaesthetist and intensive care specialist uh, from Queensland, as well as Dr. Glenn Ryan, an emergency physician from Queensland and Dr. Annalise Coco, a fellow in Queensland. Um, I'd also then like to throw to my colleague, uh, Dr. Scott Demores, who's the president-elect of YATSIC, to say a few words and also then uh, introduce our international panel members. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'd like to also um, echo um, welcome to everybody in Australia, New Zealand, who's participating tonight and everyone overseas as well, uh, and also, thank and acknowledge um, ANZUS uh, for this uh, collaborative event uh, with the ATSIC on behalf of um, the ATSIC president, Dr. Elmine Stain from Cape Town, as well as uh, uh, past president, uh, Tina Garter from Oslo. Um, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, we've got a few um, international panelists. I'd like to introduce them uh, tonight. Um, we've got Dr. Sanai Odin from uh, Mongolia, from uh, Ulaanbaatar. Uh, who is a surgeon uh, in Ulaanbaatar uh, with an interest in trauma. Uh, welcome, um, welcome, Dr. Dean, and also um, Dr. Narain uh, Chotiros Niramit from uh, Chiang Mai University uh, in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, Narain has uh, um, been a frequent visitor to um, Australia, to uh, many of our courses and conferences, uh, and uh, many of us have also visited him in Thailand. So welcome, Narain, uh, and welcome, uh, Sanai. I hope Dr. Uh, L.T. Tio, uh, who's a trauma and acute care surgeon from uh, Tan Tok Seng in Singapore, will join us a little bit later. Um, uh, but thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you, Anzus, again. Um, just a reminder for everybody uh, tonight, um, when you have questions, please feel free at any point during the presentations to uh, put them into the chat function on Zoom. Uh, and we will, uh, when it comes to um, discussion and panel time later, uh, bring up your questions at that point. Jeremy. Yeah, so uh, again, so then thanks for that, Scott. Um, so I'd like to then uh, pass it over to uh, James McKay to give his presentation. Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen here. 
hopefully that comes through all okay. Um, yeah, look, thanks again, echoing the, the welcome from uh, Jeremy and Scott. It, it's um, humble to be able to present on behalf of ANZUS and in collaboration with IATSIC. So I've been asked to present on damage control resuscitation from the ER to the OR, and it soon became apparent trying to put together a talk to deliver in 45 minutes to an hour that it's quite a large topic to condense down. So what I've taken the approach um, is to give more of an overview and try to focus at times on, on what some of the um, more in-depth points will be. So I apologize for some of those viewing that this might be uh, a little bit simple in times and some people um, may know a lot of all uh, the content and, and hopefully we'll have some questions at the end and, and even better hopefully generate a bit of debate because certainly a lot of the concepts we go through are not necessarily uh, proven. Um, I've got no real disclosures to make other than the one that the, the panelists know already, which is I did write this presentation today. I made the classical mistake of not backing mine up other than on my computer, which failed. And so uh, bear with me while I um, go through some relatively new slides. So this is a recent case I had about two weeks ago, and I think it, it highlights um, the sort of patient we're talking about. He was a young male, previously fit and well. He was a driver of a single cab truck, a high-speed motor vehicle crash. And he had a prolonged extrication and the driver of the other vehicle died at the scene. He presented to us intubated with initial observations of tachycardia, significant hypotension, low saturations and a GCS of three, although was intubated at the time, but was reported to be agitated before, but a GCS of 13. He had a no, uh, positive EFAST, um, particularly in the right upper quadrant with bilateral pneumothoraces, a normal chest X-ray otherwise, and an open book pelvic fracture. And although these aren't his images, that gives an idea of the equivalent severity of the pelvic fracture we found at the time. Um, so the questions asked, and this was um, particularly relevant for this case because it was mostly junior surgical staff on at least, um, and was occurring late at night. And the, pro the question is, what is the best approach to this particular patient's resuscitation? Um, and most people would agree that they need surgery, but what does one do uh, until they can get to the surgical side of things for definitive hemorrhage control. So I thought I'd go back a little bit and without rehashing the entire history of damage control resuscitation um, or resuscitation in general, which a lot of people have a vague idea about. Um, this is an old graph I found in a, in a paper a while back, which sums up in general the trends over the last 100 years in regards to trauma fluid-based resuscitation. And what we found early on where people had a lot of strong clinical observations and theories, but very little resources, they tended to trend towards the hypovolemic based resuscitation. And as the resources boomed and increased along with these theories, um, we tended to drift in the mid 20th century to a more hypervolemia and significant crystalloid and high volume fluid resuscitation. And then once the data became a bit more robust and scientific methods came in, we tended to drift the other way. And I think we're going to end up somewhere in between. So why are we talking about damage control resuscitation? And I think the answer is pretty clear as we all know that hemorrhage is the leading cause of early death and trauma. Early is defined differently, but most places take it as in the first uh, 24 hours, certainly within the first six hours. Um, and it's considered in, in most areas to be the leading preventable cause of death in severe trauma. This is data from uh, our um, latest working group from New Zealand, which shows, like most other places, it is a trimodal distribution with trauma deaths. And certainly the immediate ones are the ones that don't tend to make it to hospital. But Damage Control Association tries to target the groups in the first few hours where the early deaths of which predominantly are hemorrhage related. Um, the later deaths, of course, are mostly due to um, head injuries. But the group that falls into that as well are the ones with multi-organ failure. And I think that's an, an underestimated group overall, but certainly what we do up front in the resuscitation side of things, the degree of ongoing hemorrhage um, or lack of control of hemorrhage will have significant implications for their development of multi-organ failure. And that of course has significant implications of groups for late death and late resources. If we blank, break it down in blunt versus penetrating, um, we find that the vast majority of New Zealand anyway, um, a blunt trauma and therefore the most upfront hemorrhage deaths are blunt trauma. But percentage wise, um, penetrating trauma has a higher chance of dying from early hemorrhagic death. 
Um, this is borne out in the data by the fact that most um, significant recommendations do tend to have a bigger effect in penetrating trauma. Um, and certainly from a military or combat perspective where a large group of data comes from um, that supports that theory as well. Going back to ATLS and without people having to pay attention to the details of the slide, I guess it reminds us to go back and realize that there are described classes of shock, um, which are there to essentially uh, remind us that this is a, an evolving disease, that people's clinical condition um, develops over time as their degree of blood loss um, worsens. And certainly if we have an idea of what some of these clinical signs are, then without knowing too much of the history, we should be able to accurately, within a ballpark, estimate whether someone is in class three to four shock versus class one to two. What this does is enable us to say, these people require damage control, and they're either the ones with ongoing bleeding or certainly the ones in higher class shock. This is a slide which would likely well known to um, most people and uh, deemed as the lethal triad, and these are the sequelae of uncontrolled hemorrhage and patients with these are known to independently each to have a higher risk of mortality. Um, this is a, certainly not a, a new slide or a new concept to people, but the whole goal of damage control resuscitation is to try and uh, prevent these from occurring, certainly recognise them if they're there and correct them, but the ideal is to prevent them. So going through someone who's severely bleeding and never seeing these could be classes of success of resuscitation rather than um, an overestimation of their bleeding. More recently, um, I've been seeing more and more of the description of a diamond um, with the addition of hypocalcemia. And I first saw this after having discussion with um, Karim Brohi in London in regards to a changing paradigm in the, the lethal triad of which we know these things are associated with a worse outcome. Uh, but certainly there's other less recognized components of which the, a main player seems to be hypocalcemia. And so a lot of people now are elevating that up because independently, that is again associated with a high risk of mortality outside of its effects on, on coagulopathy alone. So just briefly going through each of those things and why they're important. And um, without going into too much detail, the effects of acidemia to start with, we know that it tends to reduce contractility and cardiac output. It worsens vaso and, and venodilation and has a significant worsening effect on hypotension. Um, it also has an impaired effect from catecholamine stimulation. So if you're trying to um, uh, use vasopressin and other catecholamines, they don't tend to work as well. And it impairs coagulation, um, of which it's a relationship with the coagulopathy. As well as this data does suggest, um, at least retrospective observational data, that a base deficit of more than six, i.e. less than negative six, whichever way you look at it, uh, is strongly associated with both the need for a massive transfusion um, and mortality and a raise in a need for increased ICU days and multi-organ failure, particularly with ARDS. Um, the interesting thing is that patients tend to have this elevated uh, base deficit before their blood pressure tends to drop in some of these studies. Um, hypothermia is always the most underestimated one, and I think in our institution and, and like others that we um, see this quite a lot and we really do underestimate the effect. And although I've, I've cherry picked a couple of bits of data here, essentially in, in over 50% of trauma patients, hypothermia at least to a mild degree develops in um, 50 to 60% of most severe trauma patients in ED. Um, the biggest drop percentage wise in those patients in that same study was those patients while they're in the emergency department. So this is iatrogenic due to us cutting off their clothing or leaving on wet clothing, not rewarming them, not using warmed fluids, not using warmed room, et cetera. It's independently associated with three times risk of death um, when you adjust for confounders. And certainly if you get profoundly hypothermic um, with a uh, temperature of less than 32 degrees, particularly with um, significant injury severity score, your mortality approach is 100%. And we know that there's wide ranging effects of hypothermia on the body and most organ systems. Uh, the two that, that have influence for our uh, damage control resuscitation is that it, it independently worsens acidemia by increasing the proportion of anaerobic metabolism, therefore lactic acid production. But it also worsens platelet dysfunction and actually uh, impairs um, coagulation enzymes, so worsens coagulopathy. 
So they all seem to pour into coagulopathy, and this is the focus of damage control resuscitation, and ultimately becomes the most important aspect. It's difficult to control bleeding because it's non-surgical, um, but the graphs down the bottom show that it has a, a documented relationship both with injury severity, uh, but also with um, as your severity score goes up, um, if you have coagulopathy present, you independently have a higher mortality than if you didn't have coagulopathy present. And there are many different um, types of coagulopathy, and this is just one uh, paper which is from uh, the description originally by uh, Karim Brohi on the acute traumatic coagulopathy, which was the first sort of group to define this independent um, coagulation dysfunction that occurs in severe trauma patients, particularly those with hemorrhagic shock, uh, that is independent of other types of coagulopathy. And not only that, but seems difficult to detect on a standard um, coagulation test that we would use. It's a combination of tissue injury, uh, which results in endothelial glycocalyx injury, and then the significant role for activated protein C as well. So without getting too technical, the risk is that there's a proportion of these patients which are already coagulopathic. And what we don't want to do is make it worse by, as the right side of the screen there, worsening with resuscitation-based coagulopathy. Just briefly on hypocalcemia, and this is why that's been added in as a fourth one, is that it tends to have an, uh, a relationship with all the rest. Um, essentially, it's the decreased ionized calcium in the blood um, changes with acidemia. Um, with hypothermia, it reduces the liver's ability to metabolize citrate and therefore um, leads to uh, calcium changes. And, and also with coagulopathy, um, you get a reduction in the cascade because the calcium is an important cofactor for a significant amount of uh, the coagulation profile. As well as this, we all know that calcium is a, a very useful inotropic agent um, in some patients who have hypotension. So what is damage control resuscitation? And there's a quote that I remember reading years ago at, at an American conference that it was considered the most important advance in the trauma care for hospitalized civilians. And at that point, I didn't really know what necessarily the, the concept involved in detail, but certainly was a more uh, established concept in the, in the military setting. Um, and the North American European population particularly has driven those concepts into the civilian population. So it's a systematic um, group of concepts of resuscitation. Uh, they're utilized to attempt to reduce the ongoing blood loss, but also minimize the exacerbating the already existing uh, metabolic effects. This was my attempt of trying to um, define what damage control resuscitation is. So that, children coming in the room. Um, it's considered to have three main uh, tenets to it, and we'll go through these in a bit more detail, but the first one is the use of permissive hypotension, um, which is, is controversial, um, but certainly, as we discussed, may have a role. Um, hemostatic resuscitation, which is a broad term, um, which is the, how we should resuscitate people to minimize uh, the effects of uh, worsening the acute traumatic coagulopathy, and then early hemorrhage control or damage control surgery. Um, and we're not going to speak particularly on damage control surgery in this talk today, um, but certainly we can mention it and happy to answer any questions as part in the uh, panel discussion at the end. But certainly, as a brief summary, it contains multiple, um, multiple parts to it. And the first one is the most important one, which is in the top middle, which is since rapid diagnosis. And I think this has become uh, significantly important. And what I got drummed into us a lot on fellowship is that when we think we're in a damage control situation to announce it um, and to diagnose it early. And that's trying to identify the group who are going to benefit most from a lot of these interventions. And they're the ones with um, significant hemorrhage and hemorrhagic shock. Um, there's the use of uh, appropriate blood transfusion, the use of appropriate uh, blood pressure control, um, and rapid anatomic control. And the classical approach that we think of that I always taught was you resuscitate someone, and then in the 80s when damage control surgery became uh, described by Mike Rotondo and, and others, 
um, that you progress to damage control surgery. And then once they fix all of the life-threatening stuff, then they go to critical care. And what's become significantly more um, obvious is that these are an integrated approach and they, they're not separate from each other, that damage control surgery is part of resuscitation and that um, damage control resuscitation doesn't stop when they get to the operating theatre and beyond. Um, but there are certain concepts within that that have different roles to play at different times. So if we think of this as an overall damage control spectrum of which the medical-based resuscitation and the surgical care um, have different roles, but collaborative roles to play. And with that, again, recognize the busy slide, um, the trauma-induced coagulopathy and damage control resuscitation have multiple interacting bits, particularly with the environment that they come into. And then damage control resuscitation tries to say, look, these lethal triad or lethal diamond that we've identified, how do we correct that early and how do we prevent it getting worse? <clears throat> the title of the talk that was described was from the ER to the OR, but we all know that damage control principles start pre-hospital. And um, most pre-hospital trauma care centers around the world will have robust implementation of these concepts within their programs and as we go through you'll see some of these themes but essentially the early cessation of ongoing anatomical bleeding the early use of adjuncts to prevent uh, worsening of coagulopathy the best place to start is as early as possible and so although the title of this talk is from the ER certainly I think we all recognize that this occurs um, well beforehand and certainly should be the difficulty is, is trying to get the data in the pre-hospital setting uh, that will support it. And I'm not sure about other countries, but within New Zealand, it also becomes um, a bit of a logistical difficulty and political difficulty of trying to um, upskill and train and resource our paramedic pre-hospital staff uh, to do the things which we, we know are probably going to be beneficial in their hands. So the first thing I'd like to briefly touch on is permissive hypotension. And essentially, if we cast our mind back um, over 100 years. There's a quote by Walter Cannon and Jammer that says, injection of a fluid that will increase blood pressure has dangers in itself. If the pressure is raised before the surgeon is ready to check that bleeding might take place, blood is sorely needed and might be lost. And I think this is where I hop back to my original slide is that a lot of the um, concepts that we're coming about now um, have been described before. And certainly um, a lot of these clinical observations that were made, we, we can't forget. But essentially permissive hypertension in the summary is a, an, a, an attempt to try and allow your systolic blood pressure or MAP to fall low enough um, to minimize ongoing bleeding, but high enough to maintain vital tissue perfusion. And by vital tissue perfusion, we obviously mean cardiac and neurological. Um, the concept of doing that means you try and avoid disruption of the clot that is formed, which is hopefully reducing the risk of ongoing bleeding. The important things to remember is too is that, that hemorrhage control is the goal, not low blood pressure. And although low blood pressure is, is part of the description of permissive hypotension, um, initially when I heard this concept, you get the idea of actually lowering the blood pressure is a good thing. Um, but hypotension is not the target, it's a compromise. If someone's already hypotensive, then you don't, and you think they're bleeding, you don't want to dramatically increase their blood pressure to normal tension at risk of worsening further bleeding. So hemorrhage control is the ultimate goal here, not hypotension. And it's an important concept um, to get around is, is it, we often see some people in our practice talking about reducing the blood pressure to prevent bleeding. And that's certainly not recommended. But who would benefit from it? And I think this is the bit that remains controversial. And this is, although in a lot of places in practice, um, it, it's not completely widely accepted. And it, or most of the studies come from animal-based studies. There's variable interpretation as well as what permissive hypertension means and how it's used, which we've briefly already just touched on. Um, there's prolonged retrieval times in places, and this is particularly relevant in places with, with vast spaces like Australia, where the retrieval times can be quite long. So keeping someone hypotensive for that long period of time is not necessarily a good thing. Um, the use in people with uh, traumatic brain and spinal cord injuries. And this is the, the most controversy is that there's a large group of trauma patients that likely have bleeding, 
but they will also likely have concurrent other injuries to the neurological system. And we know that there's two independent risk factors for worsening after traumatic brain injury, and that's hypoxia and hypotension. Um, so how low do we keep people's blood pressure down if we know they've got a significant brain injury when they've got competing priorities of reducing bleeding risk, but also wanting long-term neurological optimization and recovery? Um, are the, the targets appropriate for that individual? And some people's version of, um, of hypotension may be normal for them, such as young, fit, healthy people, but also some people that might be relatively normal intensive, that might be quite hypotensive for them if they're usually an uncontrolled hypertensive, for example. But ultimately, when you go back through the data, and a lot of the, the discussion of permissive hypertension is particularly primarily applicable to penetrating trauma. Um, and I think people would have to be pretty clear um, that they're dealing with a specific group of people with blunt trauma that have a short time to likely definitive surgical intervention or radiological intervention, and therefore the risk benefit would mean that permissive hypertension is likely okay. So targets differ. Um, these are the targets that I've always had in my head, and these originally came from the European guidelines, and they slightly change in different areas of the world, but ultimately if uh, you are bleeding with hemorrhagic shock and hypertension without a traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury, then you should aim for a target map of approximately 50 to 60. Um, if you have confirmed or suspected TBI or spinal cord injury, then you should target a map of 80 to 90. Um, some recommendations go further than this and, and say that, well, in a patient in the pre-hospital setting, um, that has a palpable radial pulse, we take that as enough to say that um, their blood pressure is high enough. Other places take mentation as the main thing. If they're able to mentate to them, then no matter what their blood pressure is showing, they take that as significant um, as they are, have vital organ perfusion. So these are figures which are certainly up for debate, but certainly we know there's a role to say that achieving normal attention in people who are severely bleeding while awaiting hemorrhage control is not necessarily a good thing. The bit where I've spent a bit more time on is hemostatic resuscitation. And I, I hinted earlier, this is quite a big topic and this is not gonna be an in-depth review of all of the studies uh, that go into it. But it's certainly there's, there's three main concepts behind it. Um, the first one on the right we've briefly mentioned, which is you need to manage the acute co coagulopathy of trauma. Um, so you need to uh, minimize ongoing blood loss and then you need to recognize that ongoing tissue injury and the group of people who would already have dysfunction and platelets and fibrinogen that we go to later um, uh, have a significant impact early on in their bleeding recovery. But the two main tenets are the minimization of the use of crystalloids and the use of balanced blood product transfusion. So what do I mean by that? Um, and IV fluids is essentially the goal is to minimize the amount of all non-blood product or oxygen carrying capacity fluids. And um, with the exception of red blood cells alone, um, because certainly giving those in isolation, as we talk about, may have similar effects. Um, excessive use of crystal has been shown multiple times in observational studies to, to worsen outcomes in trauma. And in most studies, they would agree that as little as 500 mils has been associated with worse outcomes. You talk to someone like Karim Brohi, and they said if you give everyone eating one even five mils, they have a worse outcome. But certainly with crystalloids, in particular normal saline, um, it causes a hyperchloremic acidosis, which tends to worsen the coagulation profile. And also you're taking blood, um, which has lost all of its um, blood products, including clotting factors out of the body, and re you're replacing it with the solution which doesn't have any of that. So you get dilution of the remaining coagulation factors and worsening of subsequent bleeding. The question is, is what if you don't have blood immediately available? Because we all know that IV fluids still remain um, a background tenant to, to trauma resuscitation. ATLS in recent years has reduced their initial recommended bolus from two liters to one liter in recognition of minimizing the input. But a lot of places, this is still the mainstay. Um, and even up until recently, we didn't have our negative blood in our uh, emergency department available um, and thawed until uh, about six months ago. Um, so we also did a study in our institution, which although we thought we were good when we identified how much 
uh, crystalloid was being given on average our severe trauma patients were getting four and a half liters of crystalloid um, of which the majority of that was given intraoperatively um, very little was given pre-hospital and a moderate amount um, in the emergency department so this is in terms of the um, concepts of these it doesn't stop once they leave the emergency department blood products are a big topic but certainly what we've taken over time is we take whole blood and through a fractionation process, we divide it up into its constituents. And this has only been done um, predominantly since the 70s and 80s. And it was done mostly because there was recognition that not everyone required every component of the blood. And from a financial perspective, you could get more bang for your buck if you broke things up and gave free fraction plasma, for example, to the people that just needed that. But what developed from that is that the, the red bit of the blood is what people recognize as blood. So we went towards the system of of uh, predominantly using red blood cells only um, in conjunction with our crystalloid. So how much do we give and, and of what blood products? And these original studies um, and landmark studies, which were observational uh, trials, which showed a relationship of, of actually what blood products you give and outcomes. And most people have seen graphs like this before or are aware of blood product ratios that if you have a low ratio, i.e. a significantly higher amount of red cells than plasma, uh, that you tended to have a um, significantly higher mortality than if you trended towards a higher ratio, which is on in a direction as close to one to one as possible. And these observations changed the game. The initial studies were criticized quite a bit in terms of observational bias that they had. For example, if you were severely injured and unstable with severe bleeding and you died very quickly within an hour in the emergency department, you may have only had time to be given a few units of red cells. Therefore, you would look like you've had a really low ratio and have died as a result. Um, whereas subsequently, we know that the bias is that it's the other way around. Um, but despite this, these observations have been proven or shown multiple times. So multiple different studies and, and large randomized and prospective trials then came out. And these are just some of the ones um, that have become um, well recognized in the area with the most recent one being the proper trial. And some of them are to do with plasma alone. Um, some of them are to do with platelets and plasma, um, which is like in the proper trial. And there's others that I haven't mentioned like combat and cryostat, um, which tend to look at what happens pre-hospital and what about the use of cryoprecipitate. But in general, they all had one thing, and that's actually the components of blood that we should be giving to patients should as closely resemble the stuff they've lost as possible. And the proper trial was surprising to some people um, that did uh, it used platelets, plasma, and red blood cells in a one-to-one-to-one -one 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 versus one-to-one-to-two -one -one ratio, and it didn't show any overall mortality difference. And I think depending on which fence you sit on, people have taken this as either saying, well, there's no difference. Therefore, I'll use my one-to-one-to-two. Um, and other people look at it the opposite direction. What it did show if in looking closer is that actually the degree of hemorrhage of deaths within the first 24 hours was reduced if you use close to one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. But certainly none of these studies are foolproof and it, and it just shows that it's actually quite a difficult area um, to study. But overall, what we've discovered is that if we try and give our blood products in a, in a so, so described balanced fashion, um, that we can achieve better results with reduction of coagulopathy and in a lot of the studies, an improvement in mortality. And there are two ways of doing it. And the first one is to say, instead of guess, guessing what we're going to be doing, that we can remove that guesswork by introducing massive transfusion protocols. And these are well established in a lot of areas around the world. In fact, most places we have some sort of transfusion protocol. Um, in Vancouver, we had two. There was an exsanguination protocol and, an, and a massive transfusion, which was slightly different. Um, and I'll touch on that later. But certainly most of them agree on, on three things. Um, one is that um, these people need upfront um, volume of blood products early. Um, so they need to be given usually O negative um, or type specific blood early. And then boxes should be delivered in ratios that relatively equal the one to one to one as possible um, between two and four units of red cells and plasma. An early uh, box with cryoprecipitate and our national one, which is this one displayed on your screen, 
and our cryoprecipitates are now in box two. It used to be in box four only, but has been moved forward um, and platelets are in box three. And there's certain aspects of this which, which aren't included here. Um, and one of them is the use of fibrinogen concentrate, um, which I'm not gonna be able to talk a lot about in this talk today in any great detail, but certainly in our part of the world, New Zealand, we don't have access to fibrinogen concentrate on its own. Our fibrinogen comes from um, plasma-based products. But certainly a lot of people may agree that if we think that platelet dysfunction is a significant contributor to early traumatic coagulopathy, then maybe platelets should be given a lot earlier than in box three, uh, like we have in our national program. The other way to deliver it is more a targeted approach. And um, it, it's always been a, a confusing thing for me uh, to look at all the different numbers on thromboelastometry. But essentially, this is where a, a sample of the patient's blood is put into a cup with a spinning um, a stick and sensor within it. And I forget which one, but there's Teg and Rotem. One, the cup spins, the other, the, the, the stick spins. But essentially, they give an overview to say, instead of all of our blood tests being INR, APTT, PT, et cetera, uh, this gives us an overview from coagulation through to fibrinolysis. Mm -hmm. And it, it should give us a, an up-to-date, or at least within 30 minutes, um, concept of how long it takes to form a clot, how strong that clot gets, and how quickly it gets that strong and also how quickly it's dissolved away with fibrinolysis. And essentially through the shape of these, we can get multiple different patterns. And um, for those of you who like alcohol, a lot of these um, around the world have a description which is based on types of alcohol glasses. But essentially from the shape of that curve, you can pretty soon tell whether you're dealing with something that may have a clotting factor target, something that may indicate more low platelets or even low fibrinogen levels or those that are in a primary hyperfibrinolysis state. And this one we particularly focus on because we're going to be talking about um, tranexamic acid briefly very shortly. But certainly if we take just the group of the primary fibrinolysis or hyperfibrinolysis more accurately, these are people that do clot initially fine and to an adequate strength, but it's then quickly dissolved away. And if we take that group alone, although they're very uncommon, they have a really high mortality, which is, I think is why there's all a benefit being shown from uh, tranexamic acid. So this is the alternative approach and there's controversy around the world as to which is better, whether we use a massive transfusion protocol or a thromboelastography guided approach to damage control resuscitation. And there's no real answer. Although there's a recent study called iTactic which um, did compare the two and didn't really show any difference. And again, depending on what side of the fence you sit on, you take it as a win for yourself. Um, those people that have point of care testing with TEG and have the training and ability to interpret and utilize it, um, I think does have its benefits. Although in New Zealand, particularly in our institution, that access is, is more limited and certainly um, more widespread uh, in the cardiothoracic theater and then the interoperative setting rather than at point of care in the ED. Anecdotally, when we use Rotem as a standard of care on our trauma resuscitations when I was on fellowship in Vancouver. And um, it, it anecdotally had two um, quite reliably consistent themes to it. And one of them is that it quickly excluded those that don't have hyperfibrinolysis and therefore we could exclude a second dose of tranexamic acid. And two, it identified a large group of patients early that had fibrinogen deficiency. And so that they would have um, high doses of fibrinogen concentrate given upfront early. And they're probably the two aspects of the trauma and um, blood product resuscitation that it more routinely changed. So you're looking through all of this and you think, well, what about just whole blood? Why don't we go back to what we used to use? And certainly there's a, a trend overall in that direction quite strongly, um, led by North America and the military. And it's shown that it, it gives a similar amount of volume, but you maintain the coagulation factor and the coagulation activity in whole blood. Um, and you don't lose um, a lot of the benefits which are stripped out with fractionation. Um, there's multiple studies which are underway and coming out, and these are just a couple of them um, with fresh whole blood trials, and there's more that are underway in the military setting. So we await those results, but I expect what it's going to show is that whole blood is better, um, particularly in those that have severe ongoing hemorrhage. The other bit that I haven't talked about in regards to blood product transfusion is, is the um, 
implication of a storage lesion and whether we use new or old blood. And it's a very hard thing to study, but the difficulty is that those who consume a lot of blood products are likely not to get either just new or just old. Um, but there's a theory that if you have older stored blood, it contains a lot less of the benefits and slightly more of the harms. And so maybe giving that to severely unwell hemorrhaging trauma patients is not the patients to be delivering it to. Nonetheless, we haven't proven whether new or old blood um, is harmful or beneficial in this group of patients. So what about some of the adjuncts? And if I briefly go over some of these, the first one is obvious and that's temperature control. And this starts, as we said, from the scene. Um, hypothermia is independently associated with mortality. So um, this is something we're very poor at in our hospital, just warming all fluids and warming them aggressively. Uh, making sure we remember the passive measures. So removing and cutting off all bloody and wet clothing, optimize the ambient temperature of the room. So the trauma base should be really hot, which is not always easy to do and decrease airflow over the patient so you get less convective and conductive loss. So cover them up, expose them as part of your ABCDE and then cover them up straight away. Um, there's a theory that warm air might be beneficial and this is usually only in those that need ventilation, of course, but certainly making sure that if you are ventilating them for any reason that is warm to humidified ventilation, particularly if they're cold already. Brings us to the topic of tranexamic acid, which is probably um, the, the equivalent of of low tidal volume ventilation in the intensive care setting is what tranexamic acid is to the trauma setting. And um, the, it came about with the, the CRASH-2 trial, which people know all of the details about, but this is a slide just briefly summarizing that benefit. Um, CRASH-2 showed that the use of tranexamic acid had an overall survival benefit, and that for every 15 minute delay, that there was a 10% decrease in that benefit of survival up to three hours, and then after three hours, there's no benefit. In fact, there's a possible harm. The subgroup analysis also showed that there might've been a harm in those with traumatic brain injury. And the use of tranexamic acid then, which had already been anecdotally used um, for trauma, but also for hemorrhage, particularly in the gynecological setting, um, took off. Its goal is to stop the fibrinolysis we talked about earlier. Um, the MATA study, then um, through Johnny Morrison, who um, uh, I knew through my masters in, in London and now works at Baltimore Shock Trauma, um, were able to show that um, tranexamic acid uh, benefits were confirmed, but certainly there's um, a lot of data that you read and papers that you read that have the entire opposite opinion of tranexamic acid. The, one of the criticisms of CRASH too, that there was a significant proportion of their patients that weren't that sick or that didn't have significant bleeding. Um, and so actually, um, overall, there's a group in there that you might be doing harm to. And I, I'm not sure whether I agree entirely that transamic acid does harm, but it may be like most things that we're not um, accurately targeting the exact population we need to. Um, subsequently, there's been CRASH-3, which is specifically looking at the use of transamic acid in head injury patients following CRASH-2, which has shown that it's safe. Um, and then the STAMP trial, which is um, a comparison, correct me on the details, of giving a, a pre-hospital tranexamic acid of either the classical one gram plus an infusion or um, a two gram bolus, and it showed no difference. And certainly our hospitals moved to a two gram bolus. So I think there's a lot of debate ongoing about the use of tranexamic acid, but I think um, at least in our institution and, and in New Zealand and, and I think a lot of Australasia is that if you have a severely bleeding hemorrhaging trauma patients that early use of at least a bolus of transamic acid ideally in the pre-hospital setting is a benefit with, with very little risk although it does have a um, thromboembolic risk to it. The common effect 7A, um, the jury's in and that's pretty much out. When I was a, a junior um, Doctor, this was a big thing. And even though who's severely bleeding, you rang up the hematologist for your recombinant factor 7A, and then it quickly became uh, that it didn't have any clearly identifiable benefit. Again, whether this is like activated protein C, we might just be missing the right group. Um, but certainly a lot of places have gone away from its routine use, but certainly there are some institutions which in selective bleeding patients which aren't responding, recombinant factor 7A may be one of the options that is still up, up people's sleeves. Um, calcium is one that we have a reminder on a massive transfusion protocol, but I think it needs to be a bit stronger indicated than that. And there's 
very low likelihood of people becoming hypercalcemic because you're giving them too much calcium. Uh, but certainly early use um, of calcium supplementation um, as um, both the anticoagulation, but also a, um, a good um, a hypotension treatment um, early on is becoming more paramount. And I think it, what some people's prediction when you talk to them overseas that this will become a standard of care, um, at least early considerations um, for the use of uh, calcium early in the patient's resuscitation in the emergency department. Um, Reboa is something I'll, I'll briefly touch on, and I think this is part of the resuscitation in terms of where it occurs in the emergency department, but really it's a, a temporary um, occlusion-based device to control bleeding. Um, for those who are not familiar, um, it's a retrograde endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, um, and we had access to it in uh, Vancouver with the balloon that's noted at the top there, which is specifically for a Reboa balloon rather than the original ones, which were more um, utilizing existing vascular catheters. Um, and it's pretty uncommon to use. We did about um, six or seven in Vancouver, which I got to do one, um, and they were limited to the trauma surgeons and fellows only. But essentially, this is a group of patients who you think have got subdiaphragmatic major hemorrhage, likely arterial. And it's like putting a clamp on the aorta that you can reduce the amount of ongoing blood loss while you're attempting the resuscitation. But again, it needs to be done en route to a de definitive uh, intervention because you can't just leave them with a clamp day order for a long period of time. Um, this is a, a, a utilized device predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm unsure my panel colleagues may correct me about Australia, but certainly within New Zealand, we don't have access to it. Um, and it's something that requires a significant amount of training and experience. And certainly the volumes that we get um, probably wouldn't justify the use of Rabao, but that's what people said about dialysis and other things in intensive care. Um, reversal of drugs is becoming more common and, and as the names become more difficult to pronounce, um, they also become often more difficult to reverse. And certainly when I trained, it was much simpler. There was um, heparin infusions and there was warfarin and they both had their um, reversal agents and they were relatively conceptually easy to understand but that's becoming more difficult and also more expensive and so certainly most places that deal with major bleeding and trauma need to have a plan in place to say how are we going to reverse some of these novel anticoagulants um, some of them like river roxaban and all other bands we don't have access to um, adnexit alpha here in new zealand as a funded medication um, and so certainly we rely on classical blood product resuscitation still. We do have access to Praxbind. Um, but this is a, an increasingly um, complex area considering the evidence would suggest that a lot more patients benefit from a lot of these medications. So they are going to become more prevalent in our population. And there's a couple of special groups. And again, this is not news to people, but certainly the geriatric and the pregnant groups um, have a particular aspects to their care which we can't underestimate and particularly the geriatric groups they're more likely to be on these drugs that we just talked about they're more likely to have pre-existing conditions that would affect their organs and their vital signs can be quite difficult to interpret because of the medications and the conditions they have pregnancy again we need to recognize they're dealing with two patients although one comes first but we can't forget the other there's more likelihood of causing and subsequent problems in the pregnancy with anti-D, particularly if you don't use um, rhesus negative blood. And then if they're hemorrhaging and resuscitation, um, there are significant changes that they present late with shock and that we may need to displace the uterus, et cetera, to optimize venous return to reduce compression in the IVC. But overall, the concepts and the approach is the same in all of these patients. You just have to remember some of the caveats uh, that are there. This is a, a, a brief plug for Code Crimson, which is something that's, that's new to us here in New Zealand that we're rolling out nationwide, but certainly is not a new concept around. And it's a way of saying, how do we bundle together damage control resuscitation principles into some bundle of care for um, critically bleeding patients um, that's activated ideally pre-hospital? And it gives people a pathway to say, how do we um, aggressively treat these patients with severe hemorrhage? by early initiation of balanced blood product transfusion um, 
and early activation of senior medical staff for urgent decision making. And it's a very busy slide, I apologise, but this is our diagram that our um, National Trauma Network, along with our Health Quality Safety Commission, have, reduced, have produced for nationwide rollout. And I think the pertinent factors are that it, it, um, it identifies the need to identify these patients early, and they need senior medical involvement, and they need early blood product and urgent definitive surgical or radiological control of bleeding. And the way that we've opted to identify them is with an ABC score, which is on the left-hand side, which is a, a relatively a proven and developed scoring system, but one of many, it's just the one that we've chosen. I know other places around the world have developed their own or use others, but essentially people who have a penetrating trauma, a low systolic, a high pulse, or a positive fast scan will score, if they score two or more, then we'd activate a code crimson as they are a group of patients we've identified as being a higher risk of developing hemorrhagic shock. And these are the goals. And without going through each one, it covers most of the things we've hopefully tried to cover in our talk today, um, minimizing crystalloid use, um, using blood as the primary volume expander and doing it in a balanced fashion in at least one to one to two, ideally one to one to one ratio. And this one actually gives transfusion endpoints um, which we haven't really talked about today, but ideally you want to maintain a hemoglobin of 80, platelet count of 50 for primogen of more than two. Um, and as we talk about the degree of acidemia, we'd like to see that the lactate, or at least the base excess, is trending towards improvement and ideally normal after six hours, which we know is a, um, has a good prognostic sign for ongoing hemorrhage. The bit that it does mention, which I haven't um, talked about, is the use of vasopressors. And again, a controversial area to say, should we be using vasopressors as part of our um, hypotension therapy um, in trauma patients? And I think that the historical view that these are unsafe in trauma patients and shouldn't be used, um, the caveat to that would be those that do require a bit of mean, um, arterial pressure augmentation for traumatic brain injury and the like, but certainly that's a changing paradigm. And the earliest of vasopressors is maybe not as unsafe as people think, but bearing in mind that the significant effect they may have on worsening of bleeding. Um, and this is the other change that it makes. And we talked about a massive transfusion protocol earlier, but this is spe a specific protocol that says in the really severely bleeding group, if we take damage control principles, actually what we need along with our upfront O negative blood and ED, we need to actually give them plasma in a balanced fashion. And we also need to add in cryoprecipitate and platelets in our first box recognizing the fact that actually from retigen deficiency and platelet dysfunction are two of the main tenants of acute craniopathy and trauma. The next stage is damage control surgery and that's a, another whole topic altogether. Um, so we won't be talking about that today, but certainly um, the surgical and radiological staff have a significant role to play in continuing the next phase of this person's treatment. But they also need to remember that the damage control resuscitation doesn't stop when the patient leaves ED and it should be an ongoing until some of those end goals are achieved. Um, thanks very much for your attention. I hopefully haven't uh, waffled on too much or spoke too quickly. Um, we've tried to cover quite a lot, but I'm happy to take anyone's questions um, if they send them through via the chat. Thanks very much. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that, James, for that very comprehensive um, presentation. An overview. I think there's a um, a lot of uh, really important points there um, about uh, the role of resuscitation. I think in that. So it's been great. We've had some um, questions roll through, and I might just um, start off with a question uh, for that, and then I'll uh, let Scott do the next one. But I guess the first one was um, an interesting question, and be interesting to see what people think but there was a question about the role of hypothermia because i guess um, from the um, question that was on there we heard that in your talk that hypothermia is part of that lethal triad or the uh, bad diamond or whatever it, whatever it was <laughs> um, but there's also some i guess some use of hypothermia in non-traumatic catastrophic events. Um, and so the question was really, at what point 
uh, or is there any point of where hypothermia is beneficial <clears throat> to prevent injury progression or you know tissue damage, brain injury, and the like? So, I wanted to yeah, see I, what I'll, your thoughts were. I'll, I'll start off, and, and, and the other panelists may agree or disagree. And I think that it's difficult in, in uh, things like induced hypothermia to extrapolate evidence from other conditions into trauma and I know in the intensive care setting it's historically been um, utilized both in the brain injury group um, and um, most recently in the um, cardiac arrest group and I think um, without going into too much detail I think in our practice in Australasia and again I'm happy to be corrected that the use of induced hypothermia for the treatment of brain injury at least in this side of the world has reduced and that it's not a commonplace now um, and even within the cardiac arrest setting we've progressively gone from being therapeutic cooling down to sort of 33 degrees with the early studies and then the TTM one and two studies the last one being only published just recently showing essentially there doesn't appear to be a benefit from cooler than versus 36 degrees um, so the, the concept being now that actually we just need to avoid hyperthermia in those groups of patients, but induced hypothermia may not be as beneficial as we once thought. Happy to hear what others think. If I may, this is Alex Douglas, anesthesia intensive care. Uh, the, there are there have been a couple of studies: the Polar study, which has been Australasia, and uh, the Eurotherm thirty two thirty five. And I think both of them really found that you may get a, an interval and interim improvement, but essentially the outcomes are worse. Thanks very much. Great presentation, James. Thanks. <laughs> Any other comments from anyone else on the panel about hypothermia and trauma? Good thing, bad thing, universally bad? Uh, I think bad in terms of bleeding control, um, <laughs> in terms of overall uh, mortality benefit. I, I'm not sure there's any much studies that do it. You know, you see on the movies, people who are trapped and survive for a long period of time but i'm not sure about the studies to show that uh, yeah i just might just throw that just for interest that uh they are trying to do miracle work i'm sure some people may know sam tisherman uh now at the university of maryland is trying to do his emergency preservation and resuscitation by inducing deep hypothermic cardiac arrest i'm not sure exactly where that's up to that was certainly approved to run this trial, but I'm not, I'm not really sure about where that's up to, but that, that looks like it's uh, really, really pushing the boundaries for that. Um, Scott. I think there's also the... some particular evidence in elderly patients that above and beyond what um, Dr. Mackay was saying about trauma patients in general doing badly with hypothermia, the effects of that in terms of worsening outcomes is even more pronounced in elderly patients. So I think your overall risk benefit of inducing hypothermia and bleeding trauma patient is almost never going to come down on the right side. Uh, maybe I'll jump in and um, uh, bring up one of the questions that's been asked online. Um, and that is, should a hypotensive patient be taken um, sooner rather than later to the operating theater um, rather than continuing uh, resuscitation in the emergency department? And, and when would you decide to do that? When is the operating theater a better place for resuscitation? Yeah, and I think that's one of my slides early on tried to indicate that it's a more of a, a continuum is that damage control resuscitation in terms of principles shouldn't stop um, or be limited to the emergency department. And I think the identification that patients need definitive bleeding <coughs> control should be the paramount and getting them there as quickly as possible. Um, but we do recognise that there's a lot of things that we've historically done as part of our resuscitation that can worse than their bleeding so when we finally do stop the hemorrhage that actually we've missed the boat in terms of the um, stopping the, the non-compressible causes of bleeding. Um, I, I think that the classical indications are those that we, we all know about your patient decides to go for intervention or indicated that should be the upfront priority but I don't think that the concepts that I've briefly talked about today should be limited to just the emergency department so trying to get that out of people's minds that it's an ED focus thing it's just a, a whole resuscitative process thing that should be flowing right through to the theater. I'm sure that's going to partly depend on um, resourcing as well I'll maybe ask um, uh, around in, in some of the other 
um, countries and, and locations involved um, and perhaps start with um, you, Narain, what is your approach to those sorts of patients that um, need resuscitation and the venue for resuscitation, be it emergency department or theater? Um, what is your approach in, in, in Chiang Mai? You mean, <clears throat> you mean the patient have bleeding, also have the hypotension also, right? Yeah, <clears throat> when we got bleeding and we cannot stop by using some kind of instrument in the theater, oh no, at the, in the emergency room, we send the patient to the theater as quick as we can because sometimes we need to open up the tummy or open up the chest and continue the resuscitation with the nest. Just keep the minimum of the pressure that we would like to, systolic pressure about 90. In my opinion, it's 90. But for head injury, we keep about 100 and, and try to send to the theater as soon as possible and continue resuscitation in the theater. And also, we also activate the MPP protocol in our institute and send directly to the theater if we cannot do it in the in the ER. This, this is what practice that we have. We do not have theater near the emergency room. We have to go to the second floor and go about 50 meters. So we have to travel very fast to the theater and do the operation as quick as we can. I don't know if anybody has any other um, um, alternate approaches. Sorry. Sorry, Scott, it's Glenn, how are you? Dr. Kai, that was a fantastic talk. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, think, I think, Scott, you've mentioned that it is a resource-based um, uh, issue in some ways as well. I guess for me as an emergency, emergency physician, it's, um, it's about where we think this patient's bleeding. Do we, one, is the patient bleeding? Two, where are they bleeding? Three, uh, and as, as Dr. McCoy was saying, continuing the resuscitation process through to, to theatre, but there'll be a couple of patients that, that certainly, I guess in our situation, that would go to interventional radiology as opposed to theatre, although that, you know, you could argue that's a, a theatre in its own right, but one, is this patient bleeding? Two, where is the best place for this patient to be? Is it theatre? Is it IR? If the patient has not got an identified bleeding source, and I guess one could argue whether or not there's any real benefit going directly to theatre to open up a cavity that uh, may or may not be benefit to, to the patient's ongoing management. Uh, Jeremy? Um, yeah, so just a, 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 just a little bit on that, uh, Glenn, I just wanted to ask you, so, because there's a few questions coming through, like, is there a, a group of patients that you'd be happy to just wave at on the way through your emergency department, you know, like as in, or should, as James said, you know, like as in historically we've, you know, we had a, a setup and, you know, be interested to also hear from Li Tsung and, and Sanai about their process for a, you know, if you get notification about somebody that sounds really sick pre-hospital, is there a role to just go straight past the emergency department? I'll start with you, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Absolutely, I think there is. Um, and I think the, the patient cohort that lends itself to that is penetrating trauma, yeah. um, where there's higher probability of, of vascular hemorrhage that, that needs a surgeon. Um, in our setting, I guess the value of an emergency department is that, that we can start to identify which compartment a patient's bleeding into, particularly for, for blunt trauma, and then start to, to think about excluding other causes of shock as well, so obstructive shock and, and whatnot. Getting that chest X-ray, getting that pelvis X-ray, getting getting some blood off, making sure that we've got decent access, which can all happen in in, in theatre. But um, I guess in our setting, we can fast track some of that stuff, making sure that we've got um, appropriate products available. So getting the, the ball rolling, but penetrating trauma definitely lends itself to going straight through to, to theatre. And this case that that um, that uh, Dr. McKay is presenting with with grossly positive um, fast scan and a pelvic fracture, that might be a, a patient that we'd be looking to get to theatre very quickly in the context of, of high probability of solid organ injury, which we can't do much for in the ED. And it's all about really, you know, our role really is in terms of, of the diagnostic and identifying where the patient might be bleeding and, and continuing resuscitation or starting resuscitation to get the patient to theatre, not to be a, a roadblock to transition to theatre. Mm -hmm. And um, Sanai, can I ask you, like as in, in your setting, for somebody that's obviously bleeding, will you do the things that, that Glenn has suggested um, in the emergency room? Uh, or yes, go to the, the operating room? Yeah, they usually the patients are sent to the ER first, but in case of uh, massive hemorrhage or um, penetration trauma, some of the patients are sent to the OR directly without going to ER. 
but the protocol says the patients has to be sent to ER first. Okay. And what about a tentoxing? Hi, hi, Jeremy. Hi, and hi, yeah. Scott. Thanks. Um, I haven't seen you guys well, but um, yeah. nonetheless, I think um, all of us have um, sort of like alluded to that uh, in penetrating trauma, there is definitely a role to bypass the emergency department. And it really depends on uh, several factors um, in terms of the quality of resuscitation that was given en route, right? The quality of your paramedical services because, uh, and also the availability of resources at that point in time when the patient needs to come to theater, right? So that's, those are the factors. And once all are aligned, I guess I agree with Glenn and Sanai that the penetrating traumas do go straight I should go straight to theatre. And I also agree with Glenn that the uh, ED should be uh, seen as a place for the active resuscitation of a patient so that we can get him somewhere rather than a roadblock, right? And we shouldn't spend too much time there uh, because there may be potentially limited stuff that we can do. The second role of going straight to the um, <coughs> OR for me, um, because we do take secondary trauma, we do take secondary transfers, are those that if we've already had a, a relatively um, good um, history and we know the mechanism and has already been um, taken care of by a um, secondary hospital and they are transferring and they can go, those are the ones that once you get a call, they can go straight to theater, right? And so those are the ones that would um, uh, bypass the ED. And our emergency department will still be on standby though, just in case during the trauma, during the transfer, they do get um, unstable and they do they need to stop by just for a quick resuscitation before going up. So in our practice, that is the model that we uh, have in place um, in terms of um, bypassing the emergency department. Oh. Um, I was just gonna bring up the next question because it's uh, an interesting one. I think it's gonna generate a bit of discussion and that's one that, um, uh, Professor Reed, Michael Reed brought up uh, regarding the role of tranexamic acid. Um, and how confident are you with the mechanism of that? I mean, we, we know about the crash um, trials, we know patch isn't uh, out yet, uh, but how confident are you in, in the role or the mechanism of, um, of tranexamic acid in, in trauma patients specifically uh, to be giving it? And is there something other than the role we know about um, that is is potentially um, uh, ha having a positive effect on these patients. James, we'll start with you. Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, and I, I think it was a multi-part question, so forgive me if I've forgotten um, half, of, <laughs> half of what you just asked. But I think that the more I found, the more you, you read on transamic acid and the multiple um, narrative narratives on it, um, the more confused about it I become. And initially what was once sort of quite solid in my mind is, is to, well, it's got a big benefit. Then you read a lot of articles that people spin it in a totally different way. Um, I think that further studies coming out will hopefully just add to um, the information, which will hopefully can confirm it's a benefit. But um, I think there's, uh, the idea was that we can identify the severely bleeding patients with hyperfibrinolysis to identify that that's the group that do it. But trying to identify them early is difficult without some form of testing. So I think the blanket rule approach is what we've taken and I'm, I'm not sure whether that overtreats a lot of others for potential harm or not. But anecdotally, as I mentioned in my talk, that's probably the one thing that we found from using TEG is that we, we did exclude a lot of follow-up dosing of tranexamic acid for those that didn't have hyperfibrinolysis. So, um, that's not really answering most of your question, but it's my two cents. So, so I'll ask the next question. So other than when it's obviously indicated in, in Tegra Rotem, what, are you using it in trauma patients uh, routinely? And when? Uh, we are in our institution. Mm. And, um, that's probably still guided historically, classically by the results of CRASH-2. And, um, and we've recently changed based on the pre-hospital studies to say, well, actually a, a one-off bolus of two grams is okay, rather than the one gram plus one gram. Um, but that's our current practice and um, our emergency department that, that sort of has done their own literature review into that, we've, we've stuck with that practice at the time being. So. Maybe ask around some of the other panelists as well. Um, when are you using it, um, Annalise? So we're certainly using it in patients who fit the CRASH-2 criteria. Um, and often 
as you heard, it's actually been initiated pre-hospital. I think the area where it's probably more under the development is that crash three population, which we were hearing about before with the patients with a traumatic brain injury who haven't got exsanguinating hemorrhage elsewhere. That's probably kind of the area most controversial at the moment. I don't think there's any real discussion if someone's less than three hours from injury, they're clearly bleeding, they get TXA. Um, that, that's not much of an area of controversy where I'm working. Uh, Sanai, in, uh, in Ulaanbaatar, are you giving tranexamic acid routinely in trauma patients? Uh, right. Not actually. I know that's the protocol internationally. Uh, it should be followed, but we don't use tranexamic acid in trauma patients. Um, I also know that there is also some practices where surgeons use tranexamic acid soaked sponge <clears throat> in the surgical field to reduce bleeding. But here in Mongolia, we don't use uh, the TXA in case of trauma patients. Okay, and and Narain? Yeah, we do have the protocol for using the TXA incorporate with the MTP protocol that we have used, but we do, do not use it in every case. Just in case that we activate the MTP protocol, we're going to give the uh, TXA together. Yeah, this, okay. this, this is what I practice, but we do not have it in the pre-hospital because the people who go out in the pre-hospital is not the paramedic, it's just the light volunteer who just trained about 100, 100 hours before they're going out to be a pre-hospital person. So they cannot do it pre hospitally just do it in the MTP activated patients. Yeah. Okay, right. And um, how about in Singapore, LT? Uh, hi. Um, so <laughs> in Singapore, when we uh, have evidence that the patient is um, actively bleeding, uh, we give it uh, in the emergency department. Isolated head injuries, we tend not to give. Right. We don't give it. Uh, we are, I'm trying now. So now we are currently reviewing the protocol to, to give that for trauma patients pre-hospital with our paramedic groups. Um, we are still for formalizing that and whether that would again uh, be really useful. Um, but I guess uh, we, uh, as James mentioned, uh, for us, we do give off the bat one gram, uh, but uh, and uh, we will be guided by the Rotem or tech after that, right? I know there's been questions that um, question whether road time or tech, uh, do we believe the result? But nonetheless, for want of a better surrogate, I think at this moment in time, um, that's what we're doing. Um, and for the Asian population, something interesting that I was sharing with Tariq the other day, um, that um, for the Asian population, at least in Singapore, and uh, um, we found that the incidence of uh, being pro-thrombotic or um, Problems with protrombosis have not been, have not surfaced per se, so that's quite interesting in that sense. So something to look at. Maybe um, Professor Michael Reed would want to share with us his data, and we can work on on that in Asian population. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know about the other um, uh, Australian New Zealand sites. I, I've uh, noted a number of different approaches in the administration of uh, tranexamic acid here. Um, lacking evidence in the um, sort of urban environment in in um, in countries like ours, uh, and get quite a variety of responses in terms of those who are giving it routinely and those who are not. Um, so I'll be very interested to see um, what other evidence uh, comes up. Um, so there's been quite a few questions, which I think this will be a good discussion in in, in small bits. Um, particularly given the fact that we, it looks like that we've got quite a few attendees from um, resource constrained settings. And so really the, the big question is about alternatives or what happens if you don't have access to well, like what we have, you know, blood products, close ratios and the things. So that's the kind of the, the big broad question and the thing that I might start with and for Alex specifically to get your thoughts one of the questions was what what what's the role of alternative fluids and specifically colloid is there a role starches is there a role um, for those sorts of fluids um, as an alternative to crystalloid because we heard how bad crystalloid is from James sure thanks Jeremy look 
multiple, multiple points to this question. I think knowing your resources and where you are and the limitations of where you are is first and foremost most important. And having a standard of practice that you continue so that you know when your patient is varying from that to know that you need to modify accordingly. Where I have everything available to me, I will generally choose colloid ahead of crystalloid. Okay, but I wouldn't use the starters at all. And I think we've got a fair bit of literature in the ICU space that would suggest that's not a bad idea to keep away from the starches. Was there more to that question, Jeremy? No, that's the first bit. Anyone else have anything to add on the on the fluids? So you think that colloid, if you had nothing. Yeah, Look, I think if I, the summary. Yeah. Yeah. If no, I, I had I, nothing, I'd use whatever I've got a little of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and resource constraint, if you've only got crystalloid, then you've, you've got not much other choice. And the next question comes to which, which crystalloid is better. And I think that's um, cutting hairs a little bit as well. But I think most would agree if you had a choice between normal saline versus some more balanced solutions, maybe they might be better if you didn't have colloids either. But I agree in the ICU setting, we're, we're biased against starches um, given um, trials, particularly in the in the sepsis setting. Um, but certainly if you had to choose a colloid, I guess albumin would be um, overall the, the um, safest, but unfortunately in New Zealand it's, it's deemed too expensive for us to use much of, so we don't need to use it. Right. Um, and so the next view then, so talking about, you know, we want hemostatic resuscitation. So Narain, we James talked about the uh, recombinant products, so prothrombin complex concentrates, um, fibrinogen concentrate, what, what are your thoughts on these products as an alternative to the allogeneic blood products that we're using? Should we just be giving it, you know, clot in a jar, in a vial, instead of FFP and cryoprecipitate? Um, in Thailand, it's very difficult to get that product to use it. So in Thailand, we just have the massive transfusion protocol using the FFP, using the platelet conch, and also cryoprecipitate. We use in the case that after we get the two boxes of the MTP, we check for the fibrinogen level and we give the cryoprecipitate if the fibrinogen level below 100. That's all that we have, but we, we do not have any kind of factor activated factor seven. We don't use it anymore. We used to use it about 10 years ago and we stopped using it because it costs a lot and did not increase the uh, survival rate. That's all what we have in Thailand. So, it's all, any, what, what about in Singapore? <clears throat> well, in Singapore, I think um, not, no major issues with um, getting the blood and the blood products. Um, and in our center, I think we are very uh, fortunate to, have, to be quite resourced. But uh, one major change that we have done in recent years um, is to actually push out the first um, MTP. And after that, we are guided by the tech and oral team results. And then we have found that that sort of um, improves the um, usage of the blood products. Whether it's the outcome has improved, uh, well, all of you know that it, that's very, it depends on who's reporting it, right? So that's what we are doing. With, um, for under resource areas, I really don't know, Jeremy, what other options do we have, man? I mean, other than getting whole blood from the nearest individual. Mm. Like, like we do in the field, right? Yeah. So, Nai, do you have um, access to lots of blood products, or is there some appeal to like using these recombinant products? Uh, yeah, as a low and middle income country, Mongolia uh, uses blood and blood products usually, and we don't have uh, much access to this. Uh, also, we have only one center for blood and blood products and the big referral centers, if they need any blood resuscitation, they have to send their emergency vehicles uh, to this uh, blood center to get blood. Or if we have any major surgeries, we have uh, planned surgeries, we have to order those blood products prior to the surgery. In case of emergency, we just have to send our uh, emergency vehicles to the blood center. and. Uh, blood and blood products are what we use usually. And what do you use while you're waiting, while it's uh, while, uh, you're waiting for the blood products to arrive? Yeah, um, because the albumin and the other products are too expensive for us, we just uh, 
use normal saline. Okay. And then the last question on this, this component to it, which I might ask Glenn, is on vasopressors in the acute resuscitation. Is there a role? What's the role? Thanks, Jerry. It's a, it's a controversial topic, isn't it, really, using vasopressors, but my, my take is quite pragmatic. If you've got somebody who's, who's uh, well, there's two components to really, to my answer on this one. If you've got somebody who's exsanguinating and you are doing your best to resuscitate them using whatever products you have available and you're not winning, then, um, then I would employ vasopressors at that point in time. Having said that, you're probably reaching the, um, the end of the line, really, in some ways. Um, in that, that uh, if the patient's exsanguinating, you haven't used vasopressors, then then you're probably not uh, not going to win. Uh, and then there's that patient who who um, and I think the evidence is is um, quite poor. And there's some animal trials that suggest that vasopressors patients who are not actively exsanguinating, um, there might actually be a role for for early use of pressors in in that cohort of patients. But there's really not much evidence for that at this point in time. So for me, it's a stopgap trying to get that patient out of the ED to somewhere where we can hopefully control that bleeding. Alex, you're an anaesthetist, pressors, trauma, bleeding. Look, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with using pressors for a period of time. Essentially, if it, it helps me pre preserve red cells in the circulation, then I'm prepared to do it. Um, look, it is, it's all situation dependent. I, I agree entirely with what Glenn has said. Um, Great. Well, look, I mean, there's so many questions that have that have come through on the chat, but I think we're actually out of time. We could go all night, like kind of with this, but I think we're going to have to, um, you know, call it uh, to a close at this point. I just really want to thank everyone, um, you know, for their questions and for their participation. And in particular, I want to thank James for his excellent presentation. Um, what you'll see is that Dr. Kate Martin, who actually is the chair of our education committee and has sort of really put all of this stuff together, um, she's put up the, the, the notice that basically all of the unanswered questions uh, that we haven't gotten around to will um, uh, be sent to the panelists and then posted. So then hopefully we can get some uh, answers uh, uh, back to you. Uh, for that because I, I can see that there's heaps of questions and like everything it's just sort of generated even more questions but I really want to thank everyone and again I want to thank um, uh, the uh, Scott Demores from Yatsik and uh, and our international and our local participants for that I think it's been a really uh, great um, uh, session for that Scott I don't know if you want to say yeah, anything th yeah thanks Jeremy I think um you know, really, uh, thanks again to ANZUS for collaborating um, with IATIC on this. IATIC has its uh, own program of webinars, but as I said before, is is really uh, enjoying the collaboration with other uh, trauma uh, and surgical societies around the world uh, to try and highlight uh, the different approaches that we have and, and hopefully uh, the different things we can actually learn from each other uh, on a forum like this. So look forward to some of the responses that the panelists are going to provide, especially to some of those thorny questions, and there are a few of them out there. Uh, but thank you again, especially to um, uh, James, but also to all of our local panelists, but especially our, our international panelists. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this. Yeah, um, so I might just throw over to Kate Martin just to uh, uh, tell us about the next trauma grand rounds and also to uh, remind you about feedback. Thanks, Kate. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, thank you once again too to our panel members. That was an excellent presentation and an even better discussion. So I will um, endeavour to get answers to your questions and we'll post them with a recording of tonight's um, webinar as well in about a week, week and a half on the ANZUS website, but they'll be forwarded to IATSIC as well. Um, in two months time on the 5th of October, I'm, I'm very excited to announce that Craig McBride, one of our our um, paediatric surgeons heavily involved in DSTC, DATC here in Australia and New Zealand will present on all things paediatric. Now, um, in tonight's, after tonight's webinar is finished, you will be sent a link for some feedback and included in that feedback is um, an, a questionnaire as to what you would like to see in a presentation on paediatric trauma. Obviously, Craig can't present the whole of paediatric trauma in an hour. So he, we're pretty keen to tailor it to what our audience wants. So if you've got something specifically you'd like to hear about in regard to paediatric trauma, please put it, it's the last question in the feedback form. 
and we will basically look at what we get back in and those with the most requests will win out. So look forward to seeing you all in two months from today. Thanks, Kate. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And have a very safe um, evening, no matter where you are across the world. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Thanks so much. all. Bye.